Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I have discussed with you about uh, these things even uh, before. Also, like uh, I'll I'll try to brush it up, like. But uh, you bring in questions. Uh, I am I am present. I am presenting in my own thoughts and what may be useful for you. But whatever you think uh, uh, is more relevant, you ask me. I can explain it. You can stop me at any point of time and uh, discuss with me, like. So the first part is about uh, the management of alcohol withdrawal syndrome. Uh, you first you assess and then you diagnose the alcohol dependence and then it goes to detoxification as such. Right? Detoxification that's what we discussed a lot. It's about uh, giving benzodiazepines and uh, not to forget giving time in also good dose of time in and treating other uh, symptomatic uh, uh, things like including nutritional enhancement per se. Uh, this is the first part. What is uh, important over here is when we do this first part right, we create a good rapport with them. And uh, there, there is a, a change in attitude towards taking treatment also happens over there. But what happens is when we leave with this and just uh, 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 they say just keep telling them like don't do alcohol it doesn't happen in that way people invariably go into alcohol or whatever they are taking like in this case scenario we are talking about alcohol but otherwise once the detox phase is over after a few months like say one month or two months they are off alcohol and off the substance but what happens is after that there are various things which makes them to uh, go back to whatever the stuff which they were taking uh, and uh, quite a few reasons are there. One of the major reasons is about craving, like the urge to have the same substance again. That is one of the major reasons. And it could be induced by uh, having a cue in the environment, cues in the environment, say like uh, passing through, uh, uh, let's say, a, a place where they used to regularly have alcohol or having a friend around whom, uh, thing like. Uh, situations around where they used to take alcohol, all these things could be cute. The other set of thing is stress. Whenever they are feeling stress, they feel like having it because that's how they used to handle their stress earlier. So that also can cause them to have uh, craving per se. So it becomes more important to handle people on a longer term, just not detoxification alone. We need to progress on the, to the next step because once we give diazepam and we taper them out of it, what we what you're going to see is that like oh there is nothing which is beyond that and uh, they don't feel very confident about moving forward because they do get the craving which takes a longer time to go away because the brain has adapted to the substance whatever it was taking and it keeps seeking for the same thing again and again so longer term anti craving agents are something which you need to consider like uh, in the long term medication there are two things like right? one is the deterrent agent as such and the anti craving agent. Let me go through both of these things. Right? Uh, before that, uh, this slide would uh, help us to have some idea about how do we manage at this center. Like we usually split the uh, patients to those who had early onset dependence and those who had late onset dependence. Like early onset dependence means less than 25 years. You can stretch it up to 30 years also to some extent, but less than 25 years is a universal thing which is followed. Late onset dependence is onset of dependence as a syndrome after 25 years. Early onset, there will be high degree of family history positivity. Many first degree relatives would have had alcohol dependence per se and late onset, there will be less number of people. And uh, uh, the other thing is about early onset is about a lot of personality factors which will be there like say, uh, the previous case which you had talked about, uh, uh, the uh, ability to tolerate stress and ability to uh, uh, control their impulse or affected over their life. But when it comes to late onset, mostly it is about uh, uh, deaths or loss events and uh, something related to some psychological stressors which is more contributing towards this stuff essentially. This is a, a basic idea which may help us to uh, select the drugs up per se. First, we go to the deterrent agents per se. That is disulfiram. All of you might have heard about disulfiram more than any other uh, uh, agent as such. Like now, who we should give disulfiram? That means where it will work. People who are motivated to quit. That's the first first thing. Like. And they have a commitment 
to remain abstinent not only this there there is a possibility that someone can supervise their dose regularly they will be ready to take it and someone is there around to supervise the dose fourth thing mostly it is not about the craving which matters it is about the external factors say like my peer group uh, there are other people in my uh, surrounding they push me to it like or uh, i really want to be off from it but there are uh, various other cues in the environment which pushes me to go back to it like there this will be of use when there is an internal craving as such like this will not help it will not be an agent which will be good if craving is the major reason why they go back to alcohol again uh this is something like there is no positive expectation from alcohol it, it is it's, it's it's a compulsion to uh take alcohol which makes them to go for it but they don't have a positive expectation like say uh, if if i take this i like i feel good about it i feel uh, uh, a kick about it or i feel relaxed all these things if are there like these agents may not be of, this agent may not be of use because this is something where it, it is like a, a stick where uh, if if a child is trying to take uh, something uh, uh, the grandmother having a stick in the hand and trying to uh, punish it like this will be like that it, it is a psychological threat rather than uh, as a anti craving agent there is no anti craving uh, property in this agent especially with alcohol so we have to select people who are motivated who doesn't have much positive expectation from alcohol and mostly the external factors which pushes them to alcohol otherwise they are ready to quit it and the family members and others are ready to monitor because if in case there is uh, they they end up in taking alcohol the family should know about it and they should immediately reach for help so this is some uh, uh, basic point which we need to look for what are the pre diselfram checklist like say before putting on diselfram what are the checklist you would like to have one informed consent this is very very uh, important you need to inform that that diselfram should will be given only after a period of alcohol being taken like say you can keep it as one week to two week as such uh, thing one week should be fine but some people prefer it two weeks as such like only after that diselfram will be given like if diselfram is being given what they should do they should not take any anything any any compound which have alcohol in it like because that will cause diselfram ethanol reaction like say pain stinners right and alcoholic uh, sharing lotions like now that those things are coming down the usage of alcohol in those uh, component has come down but still we need to be uh, telling them that these things might cause diselfram ethanol reaction so they should not take it all those things should be put in the consent form we can send the consent form which we have uh, seen i am uh, i am not sure whether this shared with you but if if it is not we will share the diselfram consent form which we have with us that will be uh, 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 the basic requisite before you are start prescribing it like because if there is a reaction happens and there are issues comes up like then you will have a major problem like without even them knowing you prescribed it and they may say that it's a negligence right so first level they should know that taking this is something is my uh, decision and it was not forced on me and i consciously take this with the knowledge that if it if i take this and they take alcohol i will have reactions with alcohol and diselfram together so this informed consent is a first necessity that's why we don't prefer giving it surrogate many family members do come and ask as okay you prescribe uh, such medicine so that they will vomit or they will have uh, this thing they should hide hate it immediately so uh, they insist on giving it like but we don't give because it is a risky proposition what if this patient has serious complications from it many states don't stock diselfram tablet in general pharmacy also so we need to be very careful about it so informed consent is the must and without the patient's consent we should not start it even if the family is have a dire necessity and needs us to prescribe it like generally what you need to look at is when was the last alcohol use keep it as a dictum that it should be at least 2 weeks back the alcohol should have been used so it can be like you can detoxify them for 2 weeks after that you can put them on to diselfram provided they 
they know that they will be put put on diselfram and they don't take anything uh, related to alcohol during that period of time other basic necessities liver profile should be normal if there is a highly deranged liver profile it is not advisable to put on uh, diselfram because that will cause certain uh, issues as such when there is uh, serious neuropathy complaints and even psychotic symptoms are there then diselfram is not a good agent because diselfram per se might worsen neuropathy in many patients as such like so if there is an, a neuropathy and uh, psychotic symptoms we should not prefer it neuropathy is not an absolute contraindication but it is uh, it is something which we need to keep in mind like and there are some people who uh, who reports about increase in bp after uh, who, who comes with uh, uh, hyper hypertension after starting on uh, diselfram per se so there should be a initial bp uh, recording should be there so that Uh, later point of time, it doesn't. Uh, we will be very clear whether it was diselfram induced or it is something which is essential and not secondary to diselfram. Okay, what is the usual dose range? You can directly start two fifty milligram, but uh, ideally uh, do not go more than five hundred milligram. I, I again, uh, there are idiosyncratic reactions which can happen with that, like very very rarely. But if it happens. Uh, uh we we need to treat that like but otherwise it shouldn't be an issue usually 250 mg is the starting dose and you can keep it with that itself like regularly monitor the bp repeat the liver function test at least once in 6 months to know whether any uh, liver related things are there like uh, many do report about sexual dysfunctions with this thing like so openly ask about is there any sexual problems which are come up like talk to them about uh, remaining abstinent Uh, minimum two weeks after diselfram, like because it takes, it, it is, uh, it is a, uh, uh, it's a non-competitive inhibition over there which happens over there. So once it binds to the uh, uh, the aldehyde dehydrogenase uh, enzyme, it will not move out of it. So the newer enzyme seems to be generated generated until then. Diselfram will be there in the body and it will result in alcohol uh, uh, diselfram reaction. So patient should know that minimum 2 weeks of abstinence is needed before stopping diselfram also educate about uh, in detail about diselfram ethanol reactions which will cause a lot of things like including flushing uh, uh, see uh, hypotension uh, 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 syncope uh, palpitations perspiration and uh, some would uh, result in seizures coma and rarely rarely very rarely death also like so this had to be educated to them I uh, mean, diselfram ethanol reaction. Mostly, the treatment over is symptomatic. If there are milder uh, things like symptomatic uh, uh, admission and observation and uh, replacing fluids, that should be enough. Uh, in the in the very severe uh, thing, hemodialysis may be needed as such. Like cost wise, it will cost. It, it is it is peanuts. Like say per month. Sorry, one. It's not one fifty per day. It's a mistake. It should be one fifty per month. Right. Each tablet would. Have, It would cost almost around one rupee or so, like not beyond that. I have put in because certain uh, uh, brands would uh, cost a little more, so it is hundred uh, uh, rupees per month would be the cost, right? This is about diselfram. Diselfram is not an anti-clotting agent. It is a psychological threat that if I consume alcohol along with diselfram, I will have severe reaction. So I should not consume. Alcohol, right? It works on that. Like earlier, what used to happen is in uh, in direction centers, there will be uh, uh, diselfram ethanol challenge tests. Also, will happen. Like they they give high dose of uh, diselfram and make them to drink ethanol, which will result in uh, reactions, and they would face it so that uh, they realize that what kind of effect will be there, and that will form a, a threat for them not to consume alcohol per se. Like, but if Uh, because of ethical uh, reasons, it is uh, not performed anymore. But still, there are certain practitioners who do that, like but we don't. Right? This is about diselfram. Is there any uh, uh, thing about diselfram which you people want to ask? If I have all those, I will continue with the other anti-craving agent also. Then we can take it up later. Anti-craving agents, like there are various agents which are there over here. Again, uh, I'll go in nutshell about two to three slides of each. First is naltrexone. See what naltrexone does is uh, it is an uh, opioid antagonist per se because 
and uh, all these stuffs do have endogenous opioids which is being increased so this have acts on them and blocks them so that it doesn't allow them to get the high this is the basic uh, funda behind giving this medicine for whom it will work people who have early onset tds like the cannabis dependence patient uh, uh, which dr shilpi was uh, talking about uh, like early onset of substance use like if this this is one thing which will be useful even in cannabis and other stuffs also even in poly substance also uh, so early onset substance use disorder naltrexone is used this is one of the drug in the field of addiction medicine where we found that like there is a specific connection between the response to uh, uh, naltrexone and certain behavior like those who have a very high degree of craving they respond very well to naltrexone right this is second third thing family history of addiction if we have if they have a high degree of family history of addiction then they are going to respond very well novelty seeking very being very impulsive and have lot of problematic behaviors they respond well to naltrexone those who want to be a social drinker you may want to want them to be off like but there are some people who would say that like no i don't want to quit it we eventually may want to want them to quit it but here diselfram will not work you cannot go for diselfram because the person doesn't want to quit it like so there also naltrexone will work this is these are the uh, cases where it will work what are the naltrexone checklist basic again here also we need liver function test and because it is metabolized through liver if liver uh, 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 functions are uh, grossly deranged then i would not prefer liver fun- uh, naltrexone over there there should not be any opioid use concomitantly because that will result in high degree of withdrawal symptoms from opioid if naltrexone is being given over there so no concomitant use of opioid any pain syndrome as such like see naltrexone being an uh, 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 agonist of uh, antagonist of opioid uh, opioids are one of the pain killer and uh, what it would do is like even for normal uh, pain reaction also you might have to prescribe a larger dose of uh, and as i said then usually it happens with certain people so if any pain syndrome is there you may not want to prefer naltrexone over there uh, the fourth point is that if there is issue of depression clear cut anxiety disorder is there then we should not prefer naltrexone over that place also what are the good clinical practice the dosage is usually 50 mg per day but what you do is you start with 25 mg half the dose for the first 3 to 4 days and then move to 50 mg per day you can go up to 100 mg per day after around a month but generally you can keep it 50 mg per day look for a, 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 if after starting is there like is there any depressive symptom anxiety symptoms low mood or coming back or not like if it is coming back then you need to reconsider the decision of naltrexone over there you need to ask for sexual side effects repeat the liver function test after 3 months these are the uh, this is a good clinical practice with naltrexone per se again cost each medicine would cost up to around 50 rupees per day on 50 mg tablet like so uh, uh, are, are, are around an approximate of 1500 to 1800 rupees per month is going to be a cost which we need to think of so uh, one of the response is that naltrexone is available in this thing like it is a good agent if people are able to uh, yes. oh you think it's available yeah. then it's very good so uh, you can prescribe it like even for the other cases which you have uh, uh, described this would be a good a- uh, agent which will uh, which will act as a uh, uh, anti craving agent for multiple uh, drug use per se acamprosate this is the next anti craving agent and where it will work this is an agent which was found to be more useful in later onset of alcohol dependence right those who develop dependence after the age of 25 or 30 and those who have withdrawn for a longer period of time those who have significant hepatic damage this is uh, uh, see uh, pre baclofen era acamprosate was one of the savior for us because this is being uh, eliminated through kidney and this is safely being prescribed in cirrhotic patients those who have significant portal hypertension and related complications alcoholic liver disease ncg liver disease also it was very useful so a alcohol dependence syndrome with significant hepatic damage you can go for acamprosate patients with multiple medical issues again there is less risk of uh, uh, problems with that like it can be started along with detoxification also 
when we, when you have a patient where you find that the person is having a high degree of craving and you uh, uh you, you know that you would be uh, you would not wait if you uh, if you prescribe it later because once this medicine has started it would take at least 2 to 3 weeks to show its action so uh, uh, in order to tide over the crisis you can even start uh, with uh, detox itself like there will not be any uh, reaction per se it it can be taken with alcohol also so you need not uh, you may not tell your patient but you you need not be panicked about this uh, when patient taking this they are also taking alcohol the practical tips which i would want to say is that like the basic necessity before starting this is like renal function test needs to be there like if there is a deranged renal function test then don't prescribe it like there are some people like say it is it is absolutely contraindicated in one condition one condition where there is bilateral renal artery stenosis in this condition it has been noted that people have shut down of uh, it's a renal shut down which has happened like so that's a only absolute contraindication one of the way to uh, it's very difficult over uh, clinical uh, this thing to decide whether this person has uh, uh, something like uh, renal artery stenosis or not what clinically i use is that like if the person is hypertensive i will be cautious then when there when there is uh, a hypertensive young onset hypertension it comes in like i would be cautious in putting it will be getting their renal function test which is nothing but urea and creat to be very uh, safer side line and then start on that uh, doses six tablets 333 mg to uh, gid what happens is uh, there's a difference when people are less than 60 kg weight you can go for 122 those who are more than 60 kg weight you can go for 222 to gid as such cost per month around uh, rupees 2000 is this also available uh, camprosite is also available okay let's see next is topiramate uh, this is an agent which can be used in both early onset and late onset it's one of the cheaper anti craving agent which is available in this thing around 600 per month would be the cost of uh, this thing like coma seizures migraine and obesity this is an agent to be used because it is an anti anti convulsant so it can be an uh, help when uh, seizure disorder is comorbid if there is a migraine it is an anti migraine agent also so that's going to be useful in that case obesity it is a, a, a it actually reduces appetite a lot it is being used as an anti obesity agent also so when alcohol dependence is comorbid with any of these things again this is one of the preferred uh, agent as such mm -hmm. the dose could be uh, uh, see what happens is with topiramate you need to have go, have, have to go slow like say 25 mg per week and at least reach 100 mg before uh, uh, before starting to wait whether there is any effect or there or not like you need to reach 100 mg wait for 2 to 3 weeks before commenting on whether there is any effect at all or not like so doses up to 100 to 2 mg 200 mg has been prescribed uh, some people come with cognitive side effects like they they will clearly say that i am not able to name things i'm there's a naming difficulty which comes to me like or a word finding difficulty i'm 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 searching for the word but i am not able to find the word as such like if this comes in like it's more because of this agent topiramate is the agent which can cause in like the tumor uh, difficulties uh, when patient has we need to be very careful is one is closed closed angle glaucoma where there is worsening of i uh, uh, i pain has happened ophthalmic uh, pain has happened uh, and uh, say urolithiasis this is this is contraindicated so this needs to be taken into account uh, it also decreases appetite when your patient is highly uh, malnourished you may not want to start this because uh, he, already there is a compromised uh, appetite is there and if this would if, if it reduces appetite further then it's going to be a problem so cost to be around 600 to 750 per month as such baclofen where it works this is an agent which is being first tried in patients with significant liver dysfunction the first trial which came out itself said that like this is a preferred agent for people with cirrhosis cirrhosis and end, end stage liver disease so that's how it came into the market strong craving when people have strong craving this helps high positive expectation from alcohol that i want alcohol for this this reason alcohol helps me for these these reasons 
this is something which is more like uh, a substitution kind of uh, medicine as such. So it may work with them. Like, and those who prefer harm reduction, I don't want to stop it. I just want to keep it. I want to regulate it as such. Like, it may be useful for those candidates also. Uh, doses. It, see, when when it comes for neurologists writing it for uh, uh, the cerebral palsy or uh, post stroke, this thing they would prefer five to ten milligram as such. Right? But here we go up to sixty to eighty milligram. What I would suggest you is in a, in a primary care, what you can do is if you start, you should start after the detox is over, then start with ten mg BD, and then go up. You you can you can go up once in two to three days. You can go up by 10 to 20 milligram and when you reach 60 milligram you can stop it by then. What are the side effects you can uh, see with, uh, with baclofen? Excessive sedation is something which is seen with uh, patients, constipation, allergic reaction and obviously it is a muscle relaxant. That's black, baclofen is a skeletal muscle relaxant. So people would say that tiredness, not able to do uh, the uh, heavy weight lifting activities but all these things have tolerance to them. Uh, there is a uh, tolerance happens to the side effects. So this may be there for two to three weeks. After that, they get used to it, so it shouldn't be an issue as such. But there are there are uh, scenarios where you need to be cautious about giving baclofen, where there is a comorbid independent seizure disorder. This is seen to uh, have reduced seizure threshold. So uh, need to be very careful in uh, prescribing baclofen in patients with comorbid independent seizure disorder, not the uh, withdrawal seizures as such. The cost per month would be around rupees 2000 uh, for any patient when it comes on 60 milligram per day. SSRI, this is uh, the last, uh, uh, not the least anti craving agent, like it is used in late onset alcohol dependence where there is a comorbid depression and anxiety disorder. And it can worse, uh, if it is being prescribed for early onset, it can worsen the uh, course also. It would cost people 400 to 500 month for, uh, per month. Sertraline is one agent which is being commonly used. Started with start with 25 and you can go up 25 every time and reach around two to three weeks one, uh, to 150 milligram. That's a very good dose to maintain uh, this thing. When you see that a patient who comes with comorbid depression and you know that this person is expressing a lot of depressive ideation and anxiety uh, disorder per se, then they would uh, with with alcohol dependence then they may help better by SSRIs, especially certain in person. We don't prefer it early onset because it was found to worsen in uh, things in early onset. Yeah. Uh, again, I'm going to the same slide to the end of it, like detoxification, long-term deterrence and anti-craving agent. One of the things which I want to reiterate is that like anti-craving agent are something which need to be prescribed. But that doesn't mean that it, it takes away the uh, uh, need to talk to these patients and get their problems sorted out or uh, trying to talk to the family and uh, uh, remain understanding about the patient's problem and bringing the patient regularly to the follow up and all those things. Like. So uh, yes, anti craving agents are not foolproof. They cannot give you 100% productivity. But yes, it helps people to moderate their alcohol use so that they can actually gain their confidence and they will try more and more to remain off alcohol in a longer term per se. Uh, thank you.